Actually, it's the same book, pretty much. Uh, Power to Persuade was the first edition. Then we reissued a second edition, which probably had 10% new material, and we changed the title. So it's, uh, they're essentially a similar book. It grew out of my time out of two things. One was teaching at the Kennedy School of Government, and I couldn't find a book that I felt told students who were thinking of careers in government, but also, can, in, and I'll get to this in a second, but also in the private sector. I couldn't find a book I really liked. And I had a lot of experience myself working in government. What I wanted to do was come up with, was produce a book that would help people figure out what it is they wanted to accomplish and figure out how to accomplish it. And the model I came up with was a compass that everybody had to think about their north, which was their bosses, their south, their staff, their east, their colleagues, and their west, which were those outside their organization, but they still had to interact with, how they had to work off of those four directions of their compass to help them figure out what it was they could accomplish and to help pave the way to, to, to accomplishing it. And that, that was essentially the, the model or the structure. And I interviewed a lot of people and looked at a lot of people and essentially said, what, what explains why some intelligent people succeed and others fail? And I wrote it mainly at the time for people going into government, but I've increasingly concluded that it, it makes just as much sense for people who are running a Fortune 500 company because when you look at what the worlds these people now run or operate in, it looks an awful lot like a political world. They're facing all these independent constituencies. They're under the glare of 24-7 uh, media and a constant news cycle. They've got to deal with unions. They've got to deal uh, with competition globally and, and domestically. They've got to deal with environmental groups and citizen groups and state legislatures and Washington, D.C. So if you're the head of, a, say, any of the major financial institutions or you're the head of an automobile company, but pretty much anything else these days, you are operating in an unbelievably crowded, complicated, competitive uh, space. So the age, if it ever existed, when a CEO could live in some kind of splendid isolation and issue commands and have those commands followed faithfully, those days simply don't exist. So uh, again, I look at the life of a CEO or someone who wants to be a CEO, and I look at the life of someone who's either a cabinet chief or an assistant secretary in some cabinet department in Washington, and increasingly, the kinds of political challenges they face to figure out what their agenda is are more important to get to, to translate an agenda into reality. Their worlds look awfully similar to me. Uh, and that's, that's what I tried to do, is come up with tools that would help people navigate uh, extraordinarily challenging political environments, which increasingly you find yourselves in. To me, loyalty has two dimensions. One is to speak truth to power. So wherever you are, that one of the things you, you owe it to your conscience, you owe it to your career, but you owe it to your boss, is to tell your boss not what he or she wants to hear, but what they need to hear. And you need to be creative, but you also just need to be intellectually honest. And if you disagree, you need to disagree, and here's why. The other half of loyalty up, though, of what you owe your boss, is when your boss decides uh, makes a decision and it doesn't necessarily go your way, you've got to live with it. You, you can't undermine it, you can't be disloyal, and you don't want to resign every time you don't uh, have your way. It's something I actually write about in the, the Iraq book. because I had to live with the question of whether to stay or resign when, when decisions didn't go my way. And my view is uh, it, 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 either it has to be a very big decision that doesn't go your way, and those are rare, fortunately, in life, or it has to be the accumulation of a large number of medium-sized decisions that don't go your way, and you say, hey, this isn't the right place for me. But otherwise, it seems to me you essentially, part of what you owe your boss loyalty up is a, a willingness to work with them. If you've been heard out, and even if it goes against you, that uh, you, you don't essentially pick up your marbles and go home. Go home. I, I mention this because in my experience, most people often do neither. A lot of people are afraid to speak truth to power because they're feared there's going to be retribution or retaliation. And secondly, if they don't get the decision they want, one way or another, they sabotage it. They're not enthusiastic or they don't do all that they could and should. They're not professional about implementing it. I'd also say while we're on it, there's also loyalty down. 
from north to south, what bosses owe their subordinates. And you, it seems to me you owe them their day in court, a chance to make the arguments. If you go against them, you, uh, you've got to, I think you owe it to them an explanation as to why. And if you do those things, I think you're more likely to get the sort of uh, behavior you want from your, from your, from your staff. Mm -hmm.